Welcome to Inside Politics. I'm John King. Thanks for sharing your day with us. Back to work at the White House after a devastating defeat. And as Washington, the blame game rages. The House Speaker goes public, gets public love, excuse me, after a bizarre presidential tweet. He doesn't blame Paul Ryan. In fact, he, he thought Paul Ryan worked really hard. He enjoys his relationship with Paul Ryan, thinks that Paul Ryan's a great Speaker of the House. There is no conversations going on right now with regards to replacing the Speaker. It's all hands on deck with regards to Obamacare, tax reform, the border wall. Never once have I seen him blame Paul Ryan's. The folks who voted no are the folks who are to blame. Hope you got that. The conservative group that would not help the president loses one member who says it's time to govern, but others are defiant. We did the country a favor because this bill didn't repeal Obamacare. This bill didn't do what we told the American people we were going to do. And talk of post health care debate bipartisanship is everywhere, but don't buy it. Fights over the Supreme Court, Planned Parenthood, and climate change are just ahead. And Democrats, well, they see no need to play nice. The first is basic lack of competence. You cannot run the presidency like you run a real estate deal. You can't tweet your way through it. With us to share their reporting and their insights, Margaret Talib of Bloomberg Politics, CNN's Nia Malika Henderson, Jackie Kucinich of The Daily Beast, and CNN's Phil Mattingly. Just moments ago at the White House, the president met with women small business leaders. No mention of last week's big health care setback. Instead, the president just wants to turn the page. It's my pleasure to welcome such incredible women, including my daughter, <laughs> and unbelievable entrepreneurs and small business leaders to the White House. And also, Linda, thank you very much. You've been you. doing an amazing job. I hear working 24 hours a day is what the word is. Huh? <laughs> That's good. I'm, I'm not trying surprised. trying to keep up with you. <laughs> I'm not surprised. President trying to turn the page there, but as he does, what does he see? as the big lessons to be learned. Friday afternoon, just after the Obamacare repeal disaster, President Trump said members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus were his friends. By Sunday morning, though, he had decided they were his problem. At that same Friday event, the president praised House Speaker Paul Ryan. The next day, he urged his Twitter followers to tune in to Judge Jeanine. And the Fox personality began her program by demanding that Speaker Ryan step down. I will go on record. We do love Judge Jeanine, and so does the president. Uh, I, I, I think it was more coincidental. There was no pre-planning here. Uh, the president, well, the, you, you the president, the president, the president but why would he out, say watch her and then that's the first thing? Because out of he our loves mind. Judge Jeanine, and he wanted to do Judge Jeanine a favor. Got it. <laughs> Got it. He loves Judge Jeanine, and he wanted to do a favor. Uh, look, I, I actually. Let's say the president just wanted to promote Judge Deneen's show. He thought it was going to be about wiretapping. He thought it was going to be good for him, uh, and he did that. He could have cleaned this up very quickly himself. Instead, this one went on for hours about what was the president up to. He could have very quickly popped out a tweet saying, whoa, 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 no, no, I love Paul Ryan. He didn't. They took a while. Yeah, and I think that's the surprising thing here because, and I think a lot of us have heard this, over the course of the last three or four days of the health care fight, the president and the speaker, one-to-one, -one, we're on very good terms in terms of a number of phone calls every day. Obviously, a very long lunch meeting, phone calls over the weekend. Their staff, not so much, have been going back and forth and sniping. But the president and the speaker, by all accounts, have a very good relationship and one that really evolved, I've been told, in a positive way throughout the health care fight. A lot of lessons learned, a lot of kind of figuring out how one another work. And then you have the tweet, and then you have the opening segment, and then you have pure silence from the White House. It took the Speaker's office to come out and say, they had another call, everything's good, it's very <laughs> yeah. clear. He was not trying to direct anybody to Judge Jeanine's opening statement, or, and I think, or Judge Pirro's opening statement. And I think it's just kind of a, one of those things where everybody's kind of scratching their head because everything leading up to that point seemed like they were okay. And it certainly doesn't help that the history between Bannon and Paul Ryan. I mean, Trump's right-hand guy had, has, had set his sights on Paul Ryan and getting rid of Paul Ryan, I think, by spring. That was a report last year. So you can't discount that whenever there is this friction between the two, that a very high-ranking official is not Paul Ryan's friend. Yeah, and if you looked on Breitbart uh, the days after this happened, it talked about uh, Paul Ryan being on shaky ground. And all throughout this whole uh, conversation about health care, 
care of the grassroots uh, have very much singled out Paul Ryan as to blame for what was put forward. People like Sarah Palin uh, said uh, this is Paul Ryan's mess and thought that Donald Trump would come in uh, and clean it up. The Tea Party Patriots, same thing, blaming the House leadership. So there very much is an appetite uh, for this administration to blame uh, Paul Ryan or at least give a wink and a nod to what Jenny Pirro, uh, Pirro said. During the campaign and the early months of the administration, um, the reporting about kind of how does Trump work has always suggested that he sort of thrives on a little bit of chaos and competition among the internal channels. And so the test or the question for him is, um, is it productive at this point or not productive? And are we going to see kind of a reining in of this, a more consistency of message or an encouragement of these different channels to send different and sometimes conflicting signals? On the one hand, Paul Ryan's on his heels a little bit, cautious, careful to make sure everything's going okay. On the other hand, if what he really wants is a rock steady alliance between the two. This is not productive. Well, that, so. that, that's, the, that's the key conversation today. We can look back and have a lot of fun uh, as political reporters because there's a lot of chaos and a lot of mess and a lot of finger pointing. The question is what lessons is each of the key individuals, key groups learning as we go forward? The president says he wants to get to tax reform. Number one, the math's a lot harder. You needed, the, you needed health care reform. The reason they went first is there was a lot of money in health care reform to help you pay for tax reform. Number two, the question is uh, what about the dynamics? Uh, the Democrats are not going to rush to embrace giant tax cuts uh, for corporations and wealthy Americans. And so all this talk about bipartisanship, we'll get deeper into that. He needs Republicans on this issue. And so Friday, he said, the Freedom Caucus is my friends. I'm told, I think you guys all would agree, the speaker told him, don't trash these guys. I don't like them either. I'm disappointed in them. But I need them going forward. Don't trash them. But then the president starts tweeting Sunday morning, Democrats are smiling in D.C. that the Freedom Caucus, with the help of Club for Growth and Heritage, <laughs> have saved Planned Parenthood and Obamacare. Um, the president was wounded. He thought he could get these votes. He ran strong in all their districts. They all cheered the president. They all said he was great. And almost all of them said no. But how does it serve the president going into tax reform, going into other big fights? Yeah. To That's 20-something, somewhere in the ballpark of 30 people, depending on how many people stay in the Freedom Caucus. That help or hurt? I mean, <laughs> here's the thing, though. He's, had a, he's got a better shot of making friends with the Freedom Caucus again than he does of making friends with Democrats, right. who he's trashed over and over again, right. who he blamed initially mm -hmm. for this going down. So in terms of who can he convince more to his side, I, you know. But. As, before you jump in, I just want to play Ted Poe here. Ted Poe was a member of the Freedom Caucus. Now, he was going to vote yes on the health care bill, but he was a member of the Freedom Caucus. Most of those members said no. Sorry, Mr. President. And they just didn't believe it repealed Obamacare. They thought it left too much government in place. And they're getting cheered back home, most of these members. And conservative groups are cheering them for standing up to the new Republican president. But Ted Poe says, hey, we run all of the government now. We have to govern. He stepped out of the Freedom Caucus. Here's his message. I got the opinion that there's some members of the Freedom Caucus, they'd vote no against the Ten Commandments if it came up for a vote. It is so easy to sit back, cross your arms and say, no, I'm not going to support that. And then, uh, then what do we have? We have a uh, situation where we are not making uh, positive changes in the country or leading. And that's the problem we have. We have to lead. We're the party in power. You walk around with these guys every day and we're with them through this debate. It's hard for them because the speaker and the president are saying, be a loyal Republican. Give me your vote. These guys are saying this bill does not right. do what I said I was going to do when I came to Washington. Right. And I think th I've been actually very surprised, as jaded and cynical as I am, about how candid both the White House officials and the speaker was in his press conference afterwards about how this was a learning experience. One of the greatest things they learned is that the key cog in this to close this deal was President Trump was going to get the Freedom Caucus guys to go along. He ran great in their districts. Guess what? They ran better than he did mm -hmm. in their mm -hmm. districts. Right. They were getting calls to their office 100 to 1 against this bill. So this idea that the president, through his bully pulpit, through his salesmanship, could bring them along, that's now burst into flames. And I think what that means actually going forward, I think what Congressman Poe, uh, great quip, very, very quotable, no doubt about it, but he's an outlier in, in the caucus right. right now. Everyone that I'm talking to that's involved with the Freedom Caucus, with the exception of, of Congressman Poe and maybe a couple others, feels very good about what they did. Yeah. And they recognize that they took a stand that they needed to stand uh, to take. And the big question now is, are they chasing or are they emboldened? Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, it's the latter. It's not the former. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, the salesmanship uh, wasn't really very good, right? I mean, it was essentially, if you don't come with me, uh, then, uh, you know, I'm going to threaten you, I'm going to come after you, uh, and, and that and you owe worry, the president. And don't worry about the little stuff exactly, the president said. Exactly, the president did 
not use the word stuff. Into the well, that matters when you're trying to yeah. pass an incredibly complicated piece of legislation that goes to the core of the Republican Party's philosophy. Exactly. And one of the things they were worried about were premium hikes, right? right. I mean, how do they go back to their districts and say uh, that they voted for a bill that not only didn't repeal uh, Obamacare, but would lead to premium hikes among seniors particularly? So there wasn't, I don't think there was much salesmanship uh, by this president, despite what you hear from Spicer, this idea that he left everything on the field. Well, he thought just his, just him being for it, his personality yeah. could do it. And there's an impact on this as we go forward. We'll do this throughout the hour, but let's look at the Dow real quickly. The Dow is down 49 right now. Uh, the markets were down on Friday a little bit last week as well. Trump had this boom coming in from post-election through inauguration, the early weeks of the administration. That was his friend, the markets. Now the markets are saying, wait a minute, we bet on tax reform. Uh, we, I think the president still has regulatory rollback powers as an executive. But what lesson does the president learn from this? Does he learn now in tax reform he's going to have to sweat the small stuff? Or does he think he can just talk big still? His advisors should be, and I believe are telling him, that this stuff matters probably more in terms of the implications on business and the markets when it comes to tax reform than it did to health care. Uh, for constituent purposes, for middle America, you could argue for moral purposes in terms of whether people have, have health care, that test really did matter. And, and what they do in the follow-through, uh, how Obamacare is administered as they figure out if or what to do about it, all that does matter. But the implications in the business world, in the investing world, uh, matters very much that they show real planning and methodical steps forward in the weeks to come. And, and there's also, don't forget, there's a CR coming up. Oh, right. Where, right. I mean, oh, the tax no, reform yeah, aside, yeah. there's God. a continuation they of gotta, They've got to keep the government open. They've got a fight over mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood coming. That's just the beginning of the list. All things that, again, divide the parties and then divide within the Republican Party uh, on these issues. What is the sense from the Republican leadership on the Hill side? What do they hope the president learns from this? That dealing with the Freedom Caucus early on, if you give them an opening, they're going to keep asking for more. And, and I think right. that what I've heard over and over so again... The he said this is a negotiation. The second he opened the door, and look, I think you have to understand, when the president, I've talked to dozens of people who were in these closed door meetings with him, and this is how he works, right? He's not saying no negotiation. He just, this is part of his kind of conversant nature. Repeatedly, when the Freedom Caucus guys were trying to get into details, he would brush it back and, no, this is about the politics. This is about, sure, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. There was never supposed to be a negotiation on this right. bill. That's just, right. that's yes. period, end of story. It wasn't supposed to happen. And the second the president opened the door and his team kind of followed through, and continue to act like there were negotiations going on. That's what short-circuited kind of the very careful kind of make sure the conservatives have enough, make sure the moderates have enough. That disappeared. And if you talk to people that were involved in the process who are for the bill, who drafted the bill, they feel like that deserves a lot of the blame for what happened. I think the big question now is, though, is the lesson that you need the Freedom Caucus guys in earlier and drafting, or is it a lesson that you cut I them out altogether and entirely? And I don't think anybody has a good answer to that. It's hard yet. to cut them out, though. You lose that many votes. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Like, right. Everybody sit tight. Much more of this to cover as we go through. But next, spy novel intrigue right here in Washington. Questions for a member of the president's inner circle and new information about the whereabouts of the House Intelligence Committee chairman the day before he revealed key information about his investigation.